Hi, I'm Nishant. I work, I'm the developer behind uh, Julia Box. So, Shashi already spoke about Julia Box. He showed you some tutorials. And none of you have laptops here, but uh, once you guys get home, just try out uh, next.juliabox.com. So, this is our old website. It's called juliabox.com. It's the original Julia Box. And uh, it's been running for about two years now. And if you go there, you'll see this big yellow banner saying, uh, please try out next.juliabox.com. Um, so this is next.juliabox.com. So this lets you use Julia without having, without you having to install anything. And uh, this, is, this, is, this has been really useful for us because whenever we come to conferences like this, we can just tell you guys to open up Julia box and then uh, we can just give you some commands and you can try it out. So you don't have to install anything, it's really user friendly. Um, so since already you've seen this somewhat, this is Jupyter. How many of you have used Jupyter before? Okay, so some, some of you. So Jupyter is a very good interface for programming because it's like having the REPL except that you can see uh, the output right away. So I think Shashi showed you this. just happened. Okay. Yeah. So, you can try this out. In 30 minutes, you will know like most of what you need to know in Julia. Uh, it is a basic tutorial. So, we have already been through this. Um, so what I wanted to demo today was, so what you, as a user what you want to do is you have a program and uh, you want to run it. Like say a huge, uh, it has a huge amount of data, it requires a lot of CPUs. So you run it on your laptop, it's not enough, right? Like four CPUs is not enough. So you want to do something big. So then you'll have to start a server on AWS and then you'll have to keep that running. And then you start uh, running it there. Uh, again, that'll be too expensive for you. So we, we initially thought about providing a um, lot of CPUs for the users, which is what we were doing in the old Julia box. But then that's expensive because the CPUs are always running regardless of whether you guys are using or not. So what I wanted to demo was our new product, which is called Julia Run. So Julia Run is a product which runs on any cloud. So be it AWS, Azure or Google Cloud, it supports any of these platforms and it gives you CPUs on demand, right? So, so I'll demo it by showing you a Monte Carlo simulation. So, you know what a Monte Carlo simulation is? So, uh, it's, it's a thing where, uh, so what we're doing here is, um, we're estimating the value of pi, which is just a toy example, but a Monte Carlo simulation is where you, you simulate s some kind of action uh, using some random variables, right? Like people coming into a room or something like that. And then you uh, gather some data um, and from that data you infer something. So what we are doing here is we have a circle and we simulate people throwing uh, darts into that circle. And pi number, pi fraction of those darts should fall into the circle if it's a square, right? Because the area of a square is, if it's one, the fraction will be pi, pi of that, right? So. I'll show you how we'll do that here. So this is the really useful thing. So no other website will let you do this. Like they'll not give you CPUs for free and stuff, but this you can log in right now and you can use. So if you go here, I'll show you how many CPUs I have. What is happening? So my, uh, my colleague has upgraded my account and given me 10 CPUs, but by default you get three, three CPUs and uh, 10 GB of space and 12 GB of RAM, it's 20 GB here. Um, so, so Julia Run is our closed source product, but we have a client called Julia Run Client, which is open source. So I'm just going to load it here. Yeah, it's loaded. Um, so let's check if it's loaded correctly. 
I will do this with get system status, it should return a true, yeah. Okay, so self, so this this notebook itself is a Julia process, right? It's running a Julia kernel. It's shown here, Julia point six. So that is given by self. So let's see let's see what's. I'm not used to Mac. This keeps opening dictionary. Okay, uh, the job status shows us the number of workers. So there are no workers right now. There's just the notebook. Um, so let's get get the thing called uh, something called job scale. So job scale is just two numbers. The two numbers tells you how many workers you have and how many workers are loaded right now. So nothing is loaded right now. Uh, so what I'll do is this is the code for throwing darts into a circle, and it's the indentation is weird. So it throws dart in, darts into a circle and estimate, estimates pi. I'm not going to read through this code. It's um, so let's see how many workers we have right now. We should have just one. Yeah, we have one worker, and we'll now time. So you do you time anything in Julia with add time? Okay, so you put add time in front of any function call, and it tells you how much time it took. So this took 0.52 seconds um, and it shows you how much memory it used also. So now I will try scaling up this job. Just remove this. So now I am going to demand for two more CPUs. It is just going to give me two CPUs for the time that I am using it and then I can cancel those CPUs later. So I can use exactly how much I want. So I add two CPUs going to take some time. So now if I run workers, it is going to give me two IDs of these two newly added CPUs and my current notebook behaves as the master. Okay. Now the same function we saw earlier, dots in a circle, going to put a at everywhere in front of it, which will just pass it to all the workers because those are also Julia processes, so they need the code. So that is in a circle is sent and now estimate pi, okay. So now this estimate pi will run in the master and run dots in a circle in all, the, all of those processes. So let us see how much time it takes now. So it took roughly half the time, right, 26.268 and earlier it was 0.52. Um, so I, I actually have 10 CPUs, so I can go up, um, but the thing is like, let me show you. So the thing about this example is that there is some communication going on between the processes. So at a certain point, it actually slows down. So let me now increase to 3 CPUs. Now I should be getting three workers. Yes, I'll send this because it needs to be sent to the new worker. Now when I run this, I get 0.35, which is worse than last time with two CPUs. So this is probably not the best example for parallelism. With two CPUs, it performs really well. Um, but but yeah, this is the concept I wanted to. Uh, show you all because this is not something you can do on any other website. Like a lot of websites let you use Jupyter or use uh, like say Python or something. But uh, giving you CPUs on demand, how much ever you want, this is the first. So, um, so yeah, do try this out. And in the end, you can just run this. Even if you don't run this, it doesn't matter. It's not a paid account, so you can just use how much you want. But this this basically sets the scale back to zero. So once we have paid accounts, you might need to do this to save money. But yeah. Uh, there is some more stuff here which is not that interesting, it is the same thing but uh, with more 
options to run more code. Um, yeah, so this is a new Julia box. Um, so if anything goes wrong when you use this, just log out and log back in and everything will be reset. Uh, except your data, you have 10 GB of data, you can store anything you want, it is always going to be there. Um, and is, has, is anyone using the old Julia box or no one's heard of it? Okay. If the old one? The new one? Uh, you see a red thing in the middle? Oh, okay. I'll, I'll check that. Um, what else? You can install packages from this. Okay. This. Um, you can use GitHub, Git Sync. You, you have any Git repos you want to load it here, you can use it on this. Yeah, so without, for you guys it is free. You do not have to install anything, do anything. You, you just have to um, log in using your Google account or your GitHub. If you have a GitHub ID, you can use your GitHub account. And when you log in, you should see something like this. I have some files here, but basically you should see a tutorial. And inside that tutorial, you should see these notebooks. So I do not know much about deep learning, but someone's interested in that it's all stuff about neural networks and stuff i showed you these two and this is a slightly mathematical version of what we saw in this it's a tracy widham distribution something to do with statistics so yeah do try this out thanks uh, any questions oh we have a ARM build of Julia, so it runs on Raspberry Pi. Plus, we have some packages which will uh, which you can interface with the GPIO, GPIO pins. repeat question Mike, uh, what, what kind of runtime do I need uh, or just like a GRE kind of stuff, what what runtime is uh, run, uh, run time libraries are required, nothing? Oh, that's it. Okay. Yeah, it's already okay. there in the pie. Okay. Sudo apt install Julia. Okay. How about uh, microcontrollers? Like no, uh, not yet, not yet. We have a package for Modbus. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah. If you want to use, there are some uh, libraries for like uh, handling communication. communication and things. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yeah. How but it's very easy to write wrappers around C, C. Okay. And also around Python, but like we won't suggest that. But like th there are like C libraries for everything, right? Correct. So if you need something, you can just very quickly, very easily write a uh, wrapper around that. We needed something f for some conference we wanted to show. So just the previous night, we just Nishan just built a library for uh, called Lib Modbus. Okay. So like it, which was a lib I mean wrapper around that. And uh, op other operating systems like Windows and uh, Mac. Yeah, yeah, Windows. It's there. Uh, Mac, uh, Linux. There are some uh, standard runtime available, or or not, nothing is to be installed. It's just a binary. It's just a binary. Oh, binary. Just a binary yeah, a dot something like a .exe. Okay, okay. okay. That's yeah, you can go to JuliaComputing.com. Just download Julia Pro. It works on all platforms. Okay. Except Raspberry Pi, Julia Pro doesn't, but yeah. An example what I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, very, very large, it's a very large setup. Hmm. So they are using Julia and uh, yeah, all these various small 
they have these uh, smart card readers so when these contact employees get into the bus itself they know who's coming to the factory so then it's uh, from at that stage itself like you know it goes to the cloud and from the cloud the requirements are collected and then like the planning starts so that first two hours of the day is saved so today like you know it gives a lot of options see more than the things are not required languages that is so you have some modules in java or in high level languages and uh, hello and excel used inside android okay so we have about 20 minutes left um so i i have two choices for you do you want to know about how to do object oriented programming in julia yes one is uh, or do you want to see some data frames type of stuff um which is like loading some data plotting it oh people want the data sorry <laughs> some other time okay right yeah but it's different from the regular stuff yeah. so anyway you can if you so those of you who wanted the object oriented stuff you can google um, multiple dispatch in julia and you will get the manual page and it's pretty nice um, and i'm sure you will enjoy it you'll be like why doesn't every other language do this anyway so the uh, so this this is a notebook about uh, um analyzing data like loading the data and doing some kernel density estimate and all that um so we'll download the data set so in in jupyter you can use this semicolon to call any uh, linux command i'm running linux on my computer so i can call any linux command you can call any uh, windows command if you have windows so i'm calling wget to download the data set i want it's this data set contains let's see what does it contain so i'm using the data frame package to load the data and uh, the data contains what is uh, details about how much uh, a professor earns in a certain university so they, this is a table it prints it like this if you re call read table um so Uh, there is rank discipline uh, i think discipline is also anonymized abc and there is uh, years since phd years of service uh, sex and salary okay so we we can we, you can see that they, you can do a number of things with this data to see uh, what are the distributions of the values here so let's start doing that uh, so you can see the size of the data set we have uh, about 400 col uh, rows and six columns uh, so these are the columns if you can call names to get the columns and then the first 10 uh, rows can be got using the head last 10 can be got using the tail um uh, by default it returns six for some reason um there is this function called describe which will uh, which will calculate preliminary uh, statistics and tell you uh, those uh, things like what is the type of this data so string string integer here integer string again integer and then it will tell you length obviously and how how many unique values are there in the data set so in the first column for example there is prof assistant prof and something else uh, associate prof so that's why it's saying three unique values 
second A and B those are the departments only two values are there and the third one is actually not so it decided that the third one is actually a continuous distribution so it is showing you first quartile third quartile and median uh, and uh, uh, maximum and min minimum as well um, so this is the year since phd and it, it has a lot of different values so it didn't classify it as um, sort of categorical um, and then you can see the sex has only two and so salary so you have the mean median minimum and so minimum salary is 57000 and median is 107000 and maximum is 230000 so that, that is the summary function it will just give you summary stats for each column okay so so basic manipulation of a data frame so you can sort the data frame first of all uh, here I am sorting using years in service years since PhD so it will sort first by years in service and then so these people have uh, 0 years in service so they are all on top and among these people who have 0 in ser service they it will sort by years since PhD okay so that is the lexicographic ordering uh, that is what it is called so you can give like 2 columns and ask it to order it by that and then you can say one second so you can do split apply combine operations which is like uh, I, uh, grouping basically so you can say group by rank in this salary data frame and for each group each group will actually return a data frame in, in turn and then you can you can take that data frame and then create a new data frame uh, in this case I uh, here we are creating n which is the number of uh, people who fall in that bucket so we can just call length on any of the columns in this sub data frame uh, to find the count and then you can you can see the mean and standard deviation so it just did the aggregation here so it says that uh, there are 64 associate profs 266 professors and their mean salary is uh, this much and standard deviation is this much so on so this is quite useful and uh, is used often as well so another column we are aggregating similar similar parameters we want to compute uh, this uh, one has um, here we are aggregating by the discipline so the department a and b so you can see that people in b get paid more and there are also more of them and uh, the same thing by sex uh, it seems the males get paid more somehow uh, and then you can also group by multiple parameters so you can group by rank and discipline um, so here for every associate professor in discipline A there are uh, actually 26 of these and this is the mean and standard deviation and so on so you can do the same with rank and sex discipline okay um, so you get the idea this is the split apply combine paradigm so if you google split apply combine in Julia you will get how to do this the documentation of this uh, it is uh, it's actually like widely used in other languages as well so how do you plot so there is this package called gadfly um, it is spelled g a d f l y it is it is written entirely in Julia um, and this is how the plots in gadfly looks so this is this is a box plot what box plot does is uh, um, it will plot the median and then uh, the quartiles so this, this, these are the quartiles and this is the median so it will tell you sort of the spread of the data so and these are the range like the lowest and the highest value this is the first quartile second quartile third quartile okay so the so you, here we are plotting we just uh, say plot this data frame and my x axis is rank and y axis is salary and the type of plot I want is box plot 
and it will just give you this. So, it is pretty straightforward. Uh, the second plot is, uh, is similar x axis is this time instead of rank it is uh, discipline similar plot and you can also stack those plots. So, I plotted three plots I can h stack means stack them horizontally. So, it will stack it like this. So, that is good a lot of people use gadfly for publication as well. So, you can you can say so if you, if you created a plot you can assign the value variable p to the plot and then say save no no actually it is draw to a pdf file for example uh, plot dot pdf and then p and it should write it yeah. So, where am I? I am ah, I will just see where I am um, and I will go there and find this plot. Uh, yeah, so there you go. So, it plotted it for you and it is uh, pretty good for publication publications. So, that is the plotting stuff and you can have scatter plots and these colors actually look really good. I like looking at gadfly plots because of the colors. Uh, so, yeah let us see what these scattered plots tell us. Um, so, this one x axis is years since PhD and salary and you can see that it kind of keeps increasing, but also the deviation keeps expanding. So, some people remain I mean keep getting the same amount of salary, some people increase faster and so on. Um, and this one is years in service and salary it looks like it pretty, pretty much stays, stays the same. Some people have they been working for 50 years and stuff that is crazy, but it does increase in the first 10, year, 10 years I guess for professors. And it does look like the professors are a little bit more than assistant professors. Uh, so, people in discipline B earn more it looks like because the yellows are below and notice that all these plots are one liners. So, the, it also does some statistics uh, if you notice like for example, the box plot has to do some statistics. So, that is all built into the plotting package, but if you want to do statistics manually you can do that and use like just the bar plot to plot it and again the same similar histogram. So, yeah so this one is a histogram uh, we are plotting on the salary on the x axis and oh yeah how many of these on the y axis. So, there are a lot of people who earn a little over one thousand one hundred thousand uh, dollars. So, that is where like the concentration is and very few people earn a lot. Uh, oh, I do not have the FFT package. So, this one does not work I guess. So, here I am histogramming uh, discipline A and B uh, salaries of those and the color represents the discipline. So, as we were seeing in the blue uh, so this this actually looks the same as the uh, this plot except it is now divided into two areas one is A and one is B. Uh, so, yeah so if you put them together it look exactly like the first plot, but if you look them uh, look at them without in this plot then you can see that um, there are a lot of these B people and then on top of them we have stacked the A's. Um, there are other types of plots this one is another histogram where the color represents rank. So, it is it, here it shows lot of assistant professors earn this much, lot of associate professors earn this much, lot of professors earn this much. Uh, 
and this one is a density plot where y axis is years in service x axis is in salary so this is the legend you can see this these are the counts actually so most of the boxes have one and uh, some of them have a lot of concentration in this area so you can fit a linear model between so in this case we are we are saying salary is predicted predicted by some factor of years since phd plus some factor of years in service and it will calculate the factors for you and uh, the factors are these and this is just a linear regression um, the most basic type of machine learning i guess oh, i don't have this package also okay anyway so there is this decision tree package in which you can build a random forest and and uh, query it for things um, so there is another package called query which lets you write sql like queries in julia we have about 7 minutes left so th that this looks like uh, this so uh, you can see that there is like some resemblance to sql so at where at select and at collect so it says where uh, discipline is a select rank and salary so this is similar to sql uh, yeah, so that's how you do like sort of data manipulation in julia and any questions about this or anything else so we have about 5 6 minutes to close the session so if you have any questions this, yeah sure Okay, so he, uh, the question is uh, he wants to know a little bit about multiple dispatch and how it is different from object oriented programming. So let me see if I can open that thing, yeah there it is, no no, mm. okay let me just go to my home, yeah I will just show you one example I guess. So the diff the main difference is uh, in object oriented programming you write object dot method arg1 arg2 uh, to call a method of a object and uh, and the implementation that is chosen of this method so if uh, of this method it depends on the type of this object right so the method that is chosen depends on the type so if the class contains that function it will go pick it up and run it in Julia we write this this way right it, it already starts to look more general so we pass the object as any other argument it is not special or anything so and, and the method that is chosen depends on types of all of these so it is the combination of types of the inputs rather than the first one so that is why it is sort of a generalization um, I can show you an example here. Uh, if you see if you call this function called methods uh, and pass it any function for example sign it will tell you these are all the methods of sign so you can see that it is defined for floating point different types of floating points and uh, big floating point real sparse matrix and you can you, so infix operators like star also are functions so you can you can say what are the methods of the multiply operator I will tell you there are 181 methods inside Julia um, and you can see that multiplying two strings is one of them in Julia multiplying strings concatenates them it is slightly different from and plus is not defined on strings but you can go ahead and define that so plus of two strings this is the syntax for defining a method of a function so we are defining mm, uh, plus of two strings to be uh, the two strings concatenated with the star operator and uh, space okay so if I did hello plus world now it will show you show me hello space world um, so this is 
dynamic dispatch in the sense that uh, in C++ for example if you had already written some function using the plus operator uh, then that would not work with this new def overloading of that operator. Uh, but here we uh, Julia inside internally defines sum with a plus operator uh, we also benchmarked this if you remember. Uh, so this will start to work with an array of strings now because we have defined plus on strings. So this is uh, multiple dispatch so what ends up happening is uh, packages will implement sum in a different package for example uh, or a, a big function in a different package and someone else comes along they in, they want a new type of object to work with that package they can add add methods to the function in that object and get it to work. So yeah it, it allows for like a very, like very good modularity and this is a function taken from uh, quiver.py in matplotlib in a python library and it shows that it is a common thing they do right like u dot number of dimension equals 1. So they are dispatching basically essentially on the dimension of the array and then they are doing else and then they are doing they are dispatching on how many arguments there are which you could have done in Julia by just defining two argument function instead of one argument function. So that is multiple dispatch any other question I thought any other questions or yeah. Yeah, Julia is a garbage garbage collected language. Um, also, uh, there is this thing called struct. If you if you create a struct of uh, uh, so in thirty two, and then b in sixty four, how many bytes should this take? It should take. Uh, 4 plus 8 right 12 so size of it may not be 12 because of the alignment issues but yeah uh, I could do 32 and 32 um, yeah so 32 and 32 it will it will give you 8 so it is very similar to C so the reason we are able to call C functions is our structs basically align to C structs and uh, um, the ABI so called ABI is the same. So if you create an array of uh, structs of y uh, values of type y they will all be 8 bytes aligned next to each other. Um, so for example a complex number is like defined exactly like this so you can say complex uh, I can convert it by saying this int 32. 1, 1, 2 and it will be like this um, x equals 4 i equals 1, 2 I am creating a million of these uh, com I will call it this so a million complex numbers uh, size of this will be what was it? 8000 uh, 8 million so 8 bytes one next to the other any other questions yeah so there is a package called uh, images.jl so images in images.jl are just represented as uh, array of colors which are like structs of three three, three numbers yeah there is an open cv binding as well. Okay, I think we are out of time. Thanks a lot for attending this. Thank you very much.